Good morning, and uh, welcome to day three of ILEAD USA. It's my great pleasure to introduce Sari Feldman. Sari is the executive director of the Cuyahoga County Public Library, a position she's held since June of 2003. And by the way, congratulations on your 10 year anniversary. Thank you. Uh, CCPL is a recognized leader among public library systems across the United States. It's been number one in the Hennon ratings uh, among libraries serving more than 500,000 people four times. And it's also been a library journal, five-star library, for the past four years. The system consists of 20, uh, 28 branches serving 47 communities with an operating budget of roughly $68 million annually. Prior to joining uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library, Ms. Feldman was deputy director at the Cleveland Public Library. She received her bachelor's degree from the State University of New York at Binghamton and her MLS degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Since 1984, she's also served as an adjunct faculty member at the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University, teaching graduate courses in library management, reference services, and grant writing. We could fill the entire time that Sari has available just by listing her professional and community involvement uh, opportunities and activities, so I'm just gonna highlight a couple here. She's the co-chair of the American Library Association's Digital Content and Libraries Working Group. She was the president of PLA from 2009 to 2010. She's the president of the board of uh, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, which, distributed, which distributes more than $16 million annually to county arts and cultural institutions. Uh, she's also gotten a number of honors over the years. The, the vice president's award for teacher of the year at Syracuse, uh, uh, the iSchool there since 1995, a number of other achievements in the community, such as the YWCA Woman of Achievement in 2005, and a woman of note from Crane's Cleveland Business in 2013. My personal favorite is the Jane Donaldson Player of the Year Award from the USA Toy Library Association. <laughs> that sounds like fun. So I just wanted to finish up because Sari's talking about community involvement today. Uh, there was a great quote that Ashley found in an article in the Cleveland Jewish News a little while ago. And the article describes a community project that Sari spearheaded to increase AIDS awareness in the early 2000s. She got the playwright Tony Kushner to allow participants in the project to interweave excerpts from a speech that Kushner had given uh, with Clevelanders describing their own experiences with AIDS to create a new performance piece. And she'd worked with the AIDS Task Force of Greater Cleveland, among others, to create the piece. Earl Pike, who was then the CEO of the task force, is quoted in the article as saying, Sari had this incredible, incredible capacity to see that linking together different parts of the community with the piece by Kushner made it powerful to a factor of 10. She made it a community process. It's a pleasure to welcome Sari Feldman. Thank you so much. So you can see clearly why yesterday I needed to hear the work-life balance. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that I have no work-life balance. I'm all about the work. And um, I just have to say something about the toy library. And thank you, George. That was, it was an embarrassment when I saw that no editing had been done on what I said. <laughs> um, the, uh, Mr. Rogers has won, won that award in his career. And to me, to be linked with Mr. Rogers <laughs> is the most wonderful thing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm nervous about the sensitive microphone and the shuffling of papers. So if I seem tentative as I'm moving things, that's why. And um, I want to say, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. I was very excited when I was asked, less excited when I was actually writing the talk. But um, I, I just think this is a wonderful idea. I think the, the idea that um, we're bringing people together from various backgrounds. You've, all, you've built an incredible community here. So in a way, um, a lot of what I'm going to say today, you'll probably say, makes common sense. And I, I think that um, if there's been any hallmark of my career, that's it, that I'm, I'm a pretty practical person. I, I'm a little bit, you're all too young to know what I'm talking about, but I'm a little bit like these Andy Hardy movies with Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, let's have a show, and I always have like some big crazy thing, like bringing Tony Kushner to the community as we worked on this piece, and et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I'm kind of practical, is like what kind of meaning does it really add to the community, and will it resonate with libraries and our library customers? So um, a lot of what I'm going to say, again, is uh, stuff you're going to think, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. 
I also want to say that uh, it says community engagement up there. That's probably because that's what I sent as the title of this to your group. It, uh, but you know, community engagement, civic engagement, these words are all very interchangeable and you will think about it in your own language. I know that one of the groups is working on language and maybe we can come up with even a yet more interesting way to express this that my, co my community will fully understand because we have civic engagement in our mission statement and it's one of our priorities and I often wonder if anybody knows what we're talking about. I also want to say uh, most of my examples are going to come from my own background and that's of course public libraries. But um, I, I looked at it, bios of people and the projects that you're working on and I want to say that every library and information setting has a public. And uh, you know, while my examples may come from public libraries primarily, it's about engaging people. It's all about the people. And so those people for you are staff, students, each other, colleagues, um, and the general community as well. So, you know, I hope that the examples will renovate, resonate with you. And in fact, just thinking about your projects, and you may have renamed them by now, but intellectual property information hub makers, you know, you're focused on an online community, perhaps of known and unknown people who are going to come together. You may uh, never know what they look like because you may never meet any of these people. And they may be from your institutions or outside your institutions. Lost in translation. This is a group that will definitely need to learn from and then return to the audience because anything uh, you may develop, you're not gonna develop in a vacuum, you're gonna test it in some way, and then you're going to come back to those audience to see if they understand what you've created. And then uh, dig for the digitization group, you're certainly gonna be determining from your audience the needed outcomes, the design, the follow-up. And in fact, it may result in more of a community of practice. So as you're designing, the people that become involved may actually be the people that deliver the program. So, um, you know, the, what I'm simply trying to say is that as practitioners or project managers, you need to be using information from your constituents to inform your process. Quietly turning the <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I like this, for, this quote from Henry Ford, mostly because I think of Ohio as kind of Ford country, right? Um, I drive a Ford. I would not drive anything but a Ford in Cuyahoga County. The automobile industry is so significant. And also because the automobile industry is an industry that has had to reinvent itself and has done so very successfully. I don't like it when libraries get compared to newspapers. I don't think newspapers have effectively reinvented themselves and are, they're, they're going through, I think, a continuous struggle today. I was sent an email link that the plane dealer had uh, laid off 90 people yesterday. So I don't, I don't think they've got it right, but I think we can learn a lot from the automobile industry, but I'm not gonna talk about that. <laughs> but I like that quote. Um, but they've become much more responsive to their consumers than ever before. You know, now when you're interested in a car on a lot, you actually can watch these little videos of the inside and the outside of the car before you ever go to the lot and start engaging with the salesperson. And I think um, also one reality today is that our community members, stakeholders, advocates, um, donors, spokespeople, want to be much more connected to institutions. It's not enough to be passive recipients of any kind of service. They are, are more demanding, or we find that every day, and they demand results for anything where they're going to give their time or their money, even as a consumer of something. There's a tremendous amount of competition for people's time, resources, and attention. And the more connected and the stronger the relationship people have, the more likely individuals are to become users, to remain users. Um, and let's face it, word of mouth 
would ex which extends to social media is where it's at. There is no marketing tool that you have that is more effective than a Facebook post to, a, to the right group of friends or a tweet to the right group of people. There is nothing more effective in terms of growing a crowd. And uh, that's proven to me again and again. So we need to you know, kind of build on these loyalties and these interests in our service. So, um, I don't know why I keep turning back since it's right in front of me. Um, so, this is our community profile, our Ohio profile of how people are involved in Ohio. And I thought this was really interesting, especially when you look at the national data, because once again, like so many things, Ohio is the nation. Except, and I'm just going to digress for a minute and say, except in the 48% discuss politics a few times a month or more, actually the nation has a higher percentage, which is counterintuitive since Ohio has been at the center, the epicenter of you know, the last two pre presidential elections. So that was kind of surprising to me, and maybe there's a role for libraries to play in increasing that number. And this comes from the Corporation for National and Community Service, and it's part of their 2011 report. And civic engagement, as they describe it, includes activities that build on the collective resources, skills, expertise, and knowledge of citizens to improve the quality of life in communities. And again, think broadly about communities, and then think broadly about who are the citizens of those communities. And according to the National Corporation, um, they may include service or volunteerism, social connectedness, participating in a group, connecting to information and events, and political action. And um, as libraries of any type, we have all of those elements kind of baked into the work we do. And in fact, while we may want to think of ourselves as non-political, um, I'll use a public library example here. In 2009, when the governor threatened to cut the library's budget, there was uh, no better political action group to stem those reductions than public libraries. And you will still hear at the State House that the public library advocates that you couldn't have just built overnight. They were already there. That community of advocates was already in place, shut down the email of most of the representatives and the government. And use of the internet has certainly been a positive piece in civic engagement, although I'm going to mention that again later. So I'm going to uh, focus on kind of three buckets now that I've set the stage for you. And that's building the library's community. Who, you know, what, what are we going to do to make sure that we have a community? Then building the place and building the virtual space. So ideally, people move through all three of these spaces, and actually, that is the best scenario. We want to make, create, though, a visible group of connected individuals. That's our library group, people who are connected to us. Then we want them to think about us as the third place, the place that they feel most comfortable in the community, and that they connect with others in our place. And then to be using our virtual space or the virtual, virtual space of others and then connecting the library to those other virtual spaces. So we may provide um, an environment for space, so services, social connectedness, participating in a group, connecting to information and events, and even political action on behalf of the library community. Again, all of those characteristics that the national studies say is very important. So I'll start with building the library's community. When I talk about scanning the environment, I'm thinking that we actually have very natural audiences that connect with us. 
For Cuyahoga County Public Library, it's been our readers, and in fact, it's been particularly our power readers, people who come to the library on a regular schedule and borrow a lot of books. But it's more about how do you harness that power of those people. And this is critical as we um, think about the future of public libraries and all kinds of libraries. I also think that it's very important to move from customer service to customer relationships. And one of the things that um, has been true in all library types is that we've stood on these principles of confidentiality, confidentiality and privacy, which I respect and believe in, but I think we've taken it too far. I think we've used it as an excuse to not know our audiences. Um, my daughter graduated from college in 2010, and she knew the security guard in the library really well. And she knew the tennis coach, even though she didn't play tennis. And she's a library kid who spends a lot of time in library, but she didn't know a single librarian or library staff person in the library she went to nearly every day. And I think, again, people who seem confident and anonymous remain anonymous, if not confident, in libraries. So um, what I find is that people who are our library customers, as we're building these relationships, should expect more information and service to be pushed to them as we get to know them. And then what's pushed back to us is a redefining and a re-understanding of those services. Certainly having multiple entry points for participation. And you know, do you make that feasible for people? And are you making that feasible in your projects? Um, again, you know, uh, another example, we eliminated registration for our story times because we found that asking people to register was a barrier. It was a barrier because, of one, it was the registration process, but it was a barrier because people didn't want to register in case they couldn't come to all the story times or um, they felt a certain kind of social obligation if they registered. Eliminating the barrier, the barrier of registration actually increased attendance. Um, you know, I know um, making any kind of registration fully enabled on the web so that people don't have to then have a second step to do something. So whatever you're thinking about in your design, considering that as well. Um, another piece is certainly the building of alliances. Again, I mentioned the natural uh, collaborators in the community. And these are for-profit groups and not-for-profit groups. Um, you know, we are working right now on a great project with Cleveland State University. We want to do more deliberate education, more, um, you know, not quite credit um, gaining education, but we were looking at remedial education. We have certain expertise for adult students, but we don't uh, necessarily know how to design academic curriculum. So our partner for this was, um, was actually Cleveland State University to begin to deliver that program. And we have lots of examples like that, and so do you. And then finally, it's not enough to just listen. Listening is very passive. But when you really hear something, then you're engaged in a dialogue or a conversation with your customers, and you can communicate that. Um, we are making hard choices all the time, and customer engagement is certainly going to help us to make decisions into the future. Um, we need to make decisions around efficiency, effectiveness, and empowerment. We need less waste, more outcomes, and that will happen when we give users a voice. But I want to just um, make sure that I, I'm not saying that citizens make decisions, and I want to be very clear about that because um, while well, citizens give invaluable input, we could not be moving forward without them. Um, I'm going to use again an example from Cuyahoga County Public Library, one that some of you who are near to us may have read about, 
we are um, in the largest capital program in our 90-year history, and we are actually uh, closing a historic building in the community of South Euclid, and we are selling that building, and we are going to build new in that community. And there is a small citizens activist group that, uh, well, they have many um, kind of approaches to this issue. One of the things that they have been very strong as spokespeople is that this should have come to the ballot. Um, legally, it didn't have to come to the ballot, but just standing on a legal principle is not enough. We worked through a process to come to a library master plan, which was then adjusted based on realistic and ongoing financial realities. And so the Board of Trustees, certainly with input from the executive team, so we're not shying away from this, took the best information that we had available and community input, but they also had to evolve it into a plan that could work today and work into the future. Now sometimes citizens come up with good alternative to something that's not making them happy. So in South Euclid, we will not be able to resolve um, what these citizens want because they said they ultimately they want to continue to have public access to the building. We're selling it to someone who's making it a public museum, but that is not satisfying them. But in Olmsted Falls, where we were also closing a historic building, and we had proposed in our master plan to have a storefront replace it because we only needed about four to 6,000 square feet. The citizen activists came together and said, could you consider building a standalone building of that size? And when the city, with these, this group of active voices, uh, came up with the land to build the building that size, that would not cost us any money. We were able to come to that compromise. So sometimes that's possible, but that's not always possible. I mean, decisions have to be made, and that is why people are put in leadership roles. And it's not easy, it can be very painful. Um, and again, so there's always a role for organizational leadership and decision making, but decisions need to be informed by citizens. Um, when you look at successful enterprises well beyond the library realm, you know that those um, enterprises are successful because they take time and they actually spend money to engage with their customers. I don't think I've taken a United flight recently where I haven't had an email pushed to me afterward to tell them about the customer experience. So your community engagement around, around your library or your project's mission, services, and priority can help you to achieve a very distinctive identity. It can also help to make something much more sustainable and to have a pride in what you're creating and what that service will be. So there's a lot of value, value to that. And as you're um, building these services, I can say that creativity certainly matters, but what really matters more is being open, being open to hearing from constituents and being open to new ideas and experiences to impact those that project design. You're really testing your hypothesis against the greater community. So um, just briefly, I want to tell you about the strategic planning process we went through, which is not anything you know, completely unique and not necessarily what you're going to be doing, but it's certainly more universal. It doesn't, it isn't related specifically to public libraries. So we went through a strategic planning process. It actually was a refreshing of our existing strategic plan. And we made community engagement a key element of that. We scanned the environment, we found the right stakeholders, we had multiple entry points, we deepened our communication, or, or relationships, and we created a continuous feedback loop as part of that. We built alliances, we heard from our customers, including the staff and board. Our strategic plan could not have been successful without community buy-in, 
and nor would we as a library be successful without community involvement. So we asked for that feedback very early in the process to really ensure that we had the buy-in when we needed it and the time to implement the plan. We also needed to hear from our communities, all different kinds of communities, to know what external influences might be happening, what changes in our environment could impact our decisions about this plan. Um, the first thing we did as part of the strategic planning process was open it up to the community. And um, we did an online survey and had about 8,000 respondents. We also you know, dropped the survey in community places as well as having it available in paper at the library. But then we wanted to have those deeper relationships around the issues of the strategic plan. So we held 36 focus groups, which is um, the people that were helping us manage this said, well, you've got to be kidding, because that is a really an extreme number of focus groups. But to, you know, to take some of the information that we were getting from those uh, surveys and really hear more directly from customers, we needed to be more extensive. Plus, we're a big service area, so we have demographic differences from some of the poorest residents to some of the wealthiest residents in the county. And they, we asked a lot of more in-depth questions about value, um, what we were doing that we should continue to do, what we were doing that we didn't need to do. And then we took the survey information and the um, focus group information, and we developed a poll, and we did, an on, we did a phone or a scientific polling process. We didn't actually do it, we contracted for it, to test some of the hypotheses we were coming up with from those initial inputs. Then we also um, used, oh, I didn't finish that slide. Then we also did a lot around building the community, around data collection, and um, that helped to inform the strategic plan. We leveraged our demographic, our psychographic, and library use data through the Community Connects tool that we use. And that again informed and helped to validate some of the things we were finding out through the engagement channels. Um, just one example from this is that um, one of the uh, segments in the marketing segment of, that is done by the Community Connects is uh, Rust Belt retirees and Rust Belt traditionalists. And we heard from these people that all of them need more technology training. I mean, could we have known that? Perhaps, but it was very, very reinforcing to us. Then based on the information we gathered from the focus groups, the surveys, the telephone poll, and the Community Connect data set, we began to develop a draft and focused on three key areas. And one of the major takeaways from the community engagement process was the need to define prior priorities that were much more universal. And this was big learning for us. People needed to see themselves somewhere in our strategic plan. And we had, had our previous strategic plan, which we were refreshing, had um, priorities like ensure every child entered school ready to learn and put Cuyahoga County back to work. Very meaningful priorities, priorities that came right from kind of our county priorities, but lots of people didn't see themselves there. So that's why these probably seem more generic, although they're defined more by the objectives. And then once we had this draft, we shared it with the entire Cuyahoga County Public Library community. We asked the staff to review the document and identify questions and feedback. Um, you know, our frontline staff, even a lot of our backline staff that work with, that live in our communities, um, are engaged with users and customers on a daily basis. And they bring that intelligence back to the organization. They know a lot more than somebody like me. I, I appreciate that. And what they bring back makes us better informed. So we hit the road, and when I say we, I mean me and somebody else, somebody who could also hear what was being said. 
and we held staff sessions at um, every branch. Well, sometimes two branches came together because we have 28, but I had staff meetings with every staff member and also at um, our administration um, building, multiple staff meetings, to try to have that kind of reflection, although once removed from our customers, built back into the plan. And then we also created other methods for public feedback. And um, finally, we've communicated this back out to the community. And we've utilized uh, several channels and several feedback channels. I keep getting louder and louder. <laughs> and then um, now we're moving into implementation and we will have additional feedback loops once we're in implementation. Um, and I think that this is a really um, good example because it was actually very low cost. So online surveys, you know, with SurveyMonkey, you know, and other tools like that don't really cost anything to collect that data. Sorry, um, to collect that data, and um, focus groups. If you have the right questions, um, and you may even have community volunteers who are willing to assist you with those focus groups, cost money in time, but don't really cost a lot of money. Um, certainly, uh, data collection. You should be doing that all the time. So. Data collection um, is something that you can build into any planning process, large or small. And only the polling piece was expensive for us because, again, we want to stand on that more scientific, uh, well-researched piece. And then putting that together. So, uh, you know, this strategic planning process was um, uh, high touch, low cost. And I think that is very meaningful to us because we don't want to wait too long before we go through it again. It's important to be in constant planning, to have that constant feedback. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about some other ways we gather information. And these are people at our World Cafe event. So um, we uh, use town hall type meetings or big public meetings where people can come and uh, hear us talk and then respond. And I just want to say that somebody who loves the library or who hates the library or who's in between is going to dominate that microphone and you are not going to be able to move them. I also think that you don't really know those people I and mean, they might give you their name and address if you require it at a public meeting you don't really get to know them. This World Cafe methodology has been um, both a way to get more voices heard in an equitable fashion and also a way to um, have more of a relationship with the people who are contributing ideas. So we started out with bigger public meetings when we were first building our buildings and then we switched to the World Cafe. And what it, what it does is we have you know, hundreds and hundreds of pictures of different libraries from different aspects. So we have exterior, and then we have the interior divided up pictures of children's areas, pictures of uh, adult areas, pictures of um, technology areas, and these become stations. And people come and they visit the stations. And the pictures are not pictures of what we're going to build. They're pictures to help people think about library spaces. And then people respond to the pictures, or people say, I don't like any of this, this is what I want to see, or people comment on the library that they have visited somewhere else in the world they really love. It has been fantastic, because um, we have really heard important things. And I can tell you, in our orange community, we thought for sure these people wanted the most traditional library in the world, one after another. Modern, 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 more glass, more glass, more glass. We would have been way off base. And not only are we there, and we have people planted at different stations, but we have the architects there too, because we want the architects to hear from these people. So, I mean, buildings is one use for it, but there are many, many uses for it, and it's just been fantastic. 
I think you 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 may have participated in the idea in projects that have are kind of visioning exercises where then you do idea mapping. And those are also good. Again, a way to bring people together to collect information where everyone who's there can have an active voice. And then um, the third uh, thing that I want to mention is kind of that crowdsourcing idea. So Cuyahoga Arts and Culture had a special creative culture grant project. And when they got down to the final group, after they went through their traditional looking, this is, I'm the president of the board, and we give out $60 million a year to arts groups, but we had $250,000 earmarked for special projects. When uh, we went through these panels that analyzed the grant proposals and different methods, and we got down to the final group, we put it out there for a community vote. And uh, they, uh, they had, people could vote online. It was you know, a Twitter link, a Facebook link. There were QR R codes on cards, and they spent $200 and hired little minions to drop them in uh, Starbucks and different places. And the, whole, the community really had fun with this. And then, of course, the people that were up for the vote, they were no dummies. They were in places like Tower City where the rapid comes in with these little cards to get people to vote for them. So it was a really fun project and a really great way to get the community involved. So now I'm going to tell you about, a little bit about building the place. This is our Warrensville Heights branch on opening day. And I always like to say, build it right and they will come. We have 2,000 people on opening day for this branch. Um, we held two of these large community meetings. We weren't using the World Cafe technique yet. Yet, and we had eight focus groups, and then we had ongoing community interaction around plans, around models, etc. And um, it was the community has felt that they were really heard in this project. So, when we think about building the place, um, it's really important to establish partnerships and collaborations to have the entire community think of the place the library place um, as belonging to them. And that might be, uh, you know, just thinking about academics, uh, an academic setting, to have um, instruction going on, obviously to have whole class instruction, you begin to create a sense of that. It's not just about uh, groups outside of a campus coming into the campus library. It might also be, um, you know, if you're in a special library, what kind of speakers can you bring to your institution through the library as well? So um, having, you know, kind of creating that demand and enthusiasm for the library space. And then the environment has to be inviting and supportive. Otherwise, people might come once, but they're never gonna come back. And then it builds on the mission, the goals, and the priorities. And so whatever you're doing in those spaces, should be reflective of those things. You know, I'm always saying less programs. For some reason, it got into the library, the Cuyahoga County Public Library and Pathology, that I expected an adult and a children, I expected, we have tons of children's programs, but I expected an adult program at every branch, every week. Like, how did it get into the mythology? Because I would never say that, because I'm all about quality and outcomes. And so if you have one amazing program that touches the entire community, that might be the right thing. And you work on that all year, and everybody is involved. Um, connect to the broader community priorities. I can give a whole thing on this, but we're part of bigger systems. We, we think we're islands, but we're actually part of bigger systems. And so unless our library priorities and the work we do and the library as place is reflecting those bigger systems. I just don't see how we're going to be successful. So, um, you know, for me, I'm part of a, the system of the county. My priorities need to be reflective of the county's priority. My priorities are a lot about education. Um, <coughs> in a special library, we might be reflective of the hospital or the business or whatever. So, um, you know, libraries are the place for the exchange of ideas. They're a place that creates equity, where 
Um, everybody can feel that they have a voice. Um, it really empowers people um, to organize and participate. We're not just meeting rooms. We're not just meeting uh, room chairs. And it's a very safe place. People feel safe in the library. And I don't mean their physical safety, but safety around expressing opinions. We're also a very neutral place. And quite frankly, the library consistently ranks as one of the most respected places in every community. And that's all kinds of libraries. I hear that when I go to um, the, um, you know, some of the great cultural institutions in our community. They, whoever I meet, people say, I want you to meet our librarian. Like they're so proud of their library. And I know there's somebody here from CIA. Um, and uh, you know, we hear that. I have friends who work at CIA, and we hear that. We want you to meet our librarians. They're so proud of their library. This comes from um, directly from the Urban Libraries Council publication on civic engagement. And they talk about the civic educator, um, the conversation starter, the community bridge, the visionary, the center for democratic action, and as all being elements in the library as place. And um, you know, uh, just some things that I think about when I think about um, the um, civic educator. You know, how about some workshops on how to blog in a civil way? How the blogging on a plain dealer could make you sick if you read it all the time. I mean, I often get messages from staff, do not read the blogging on this piece because it's it's uncivil. And you know, that that is a role that libraries can play that ties right back into every library type's mission. Um, being a conversation starter, you know, we have a lot of people in one of our wealthiest communities who are in the library chatting about fracking. But some of them want it, some of them don't want it. But if a certain momentum happens, everyone gets it. You know, everyone will have oil and gas drilling if there's a certain momentum in that community. So there's chit chat, chit chat, chit chat. You know, we're like the grocery store, people run into each other. So we said, let's have a program. Let's really educate these people. That's a role for us to be the conversation starter. And then, um, you know, being the, com the community bridge, we have new ethnic groups coming to our communities, coming to our campuses, coming to our businesses. We have a huge responsibility to be a bridge, to be a connector of people of, of different backgrounds and different ethnicity. Um, so that's an example for that. And being a visionary, um, our Warrensville Heights project, not to go back to that, we were part of the community development plans. Um, we were at the table at the beginning with then mayor, now Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, who was laying out this blank piece of land and saying, you know, what should be here to change my community? And then when we talk about um, providing tools for democracy, um, you know, there's it, to be this center for de democratic action, sorry, it's about providing tools. And there's so much we can do with our resources that we have, our distance learning opportunities, etc. And actually embedding a lot of content into the programs of other people, the meetings of other people. You know, our, our meeting spaces are important, and I kind of said we're not just about meeting spaces, but I want to say, you know, these informal gatherings, and so I don't just mean the meeting rooms, but the spaces where people run into each other, you know, in an office setting, in a, in a university, there might not be that many places where people just casually cross paths, but encouraging that, creating that environment. And we also find that a lot of our elected officials are now using our libraries as offices. They don't want to open an office back in their hometown, so they're using our libraries. And then um, I just want to say that in all of our branches, we're building these uh, small group spaces, like really small groups. And when I take uh, potential donors on a tour, I say, and these rooms can be used for tutoring, for a job interview, uh, for a home-based business to meet a client, or for three people to start a revolution. But that's exactly what I think. Three people can sit in this room and change the world. I don't think you can get more than three people in this room. So, you know, um, 
we have this key role also in providing access to technology, and that is a big role, and that ties right back into the civic engagement. Um, not even, not only using standard technologies, but introducing new technologies. Um, all of our programming can be part of this as well. And then we have the opportunity to build on so much more deeper learning. Uh, certainly we have places where people can create, um, I hear our students working on uh, at one of our robotics programs, but, oh, sorry. There are people, children working on our robotics programs. Um, you know, libraries have, have formal maker spaces and those are really exciting, but you know, we've been doing, make, we've been making things in libraries for a long time. Um, this is, uh, people can bring their creations, not just create. So we're actually running this project right now with the Cleveland Orchestra, where musical groups are coming in and singing uh, America the Beautiful and it's being taped and then it's going to be shown on the Jumbotron at the 4th of July concert and uh, as well as on our website. So ways for actually these music groups to build more audience and to um, also connect with each other. And then this is one of our um, uh, audio recording studios and um, although I don't, oh, I don't know what these boys are doing um, but people can create new library content. So some of our, our public are creating content that we can then put into our library catalogs. So um, this is an example of that as well. Um, I just wanted to say that not all of this place happens at a library building. This is an example from um, Durham, North Carolina, where the library has meet up and it happens in bars. People meet up around books. Um, uh, Cleveland Public Library has a site in City Hall. We have a site in Metro in one of our public hospitals. People have sites in business incubators, which I think is a great outreach for all library types. So it's not all happening in the library building itself. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fourth floor, Chattanooga's fourth floor project, and you can visit it online to learn more about it but it's a public laboratory and educational facility. And what I think is so um, important about the fourth floor is that it kind of was designed with collective vision. It's used with collective vision. Um, partnerships are startups, tech companies, hackers. It, um, the environment was created around this, but um, it's also about the broader community priorities. And Chattanooga is a gig city everybody is connected, everybody is connected with a gigabit, and so the fourth floor speaks directly to the broader community. And at Harvard, um, they have the library, um, so it's, this is not just public library again. I know I have to speed up. So this is building the virtual space, and I, I don't need to <coughs> belabor this too much, because you're all in virtual space, and you all have your communities, and you know what's going on there. But you know, just a couple of highlights. Connect on all the platforms. Create multiple places for people to enter the conversation. Add content to the conversation. Ensure that the engagement is civil. I'm very big on that. And then make sure there's that ease and convenience are part of whatever is built. You know, it's a great opportunity to reach and teach through these places. Um, I think uh, also it's a great um, opportunity to come across platforms, so to be pulling things into the places where people are naturally gathering, whether that's on Facebook or through Twitter or through other sites. I, I have a neighborhood group called My Neighbors on my street where we have kind of a blog and chat together. The Knight Commission has been one of the, the leaders in the in this area around the use of virtual space to make a big difference in the community. The greatest number of people are just participants. They're just visiting sites and maybe looking at content, maybe clicking a link. Then there are people who are creators. They're establishing new communities, creating blogs and podcasts, responding to calls for content. And then there are contributors who just 
review or like, occasionally post a question, um, sign up to report on something or an event, the weather, whether a tornado is coming to the area. But I think it's important to create different outreach methods for all of these people in your community. And this is our Night Owls online book club, uh, our Night Owls online book discussion. An online book club never worked for us when we went to Facebook and we just chatted about books. Every Thursday night, we were able to build a huge community. Um, this is uh, Nancy Pearl doing Poem of the Month, and you know it's about embedding content. But you know, wikis, blogs, Facebooks, community mapping, embedding in the catalog. I don't, I don't have to uh, explain all of this to you. You're all much more on top of it than I am. But I want to say that there's huge power in local. Whatever is local for you, whether it's your local community, the place you work, the place you teach. And um, this is, again, just some examples. Um, this is the Orlando Memory Project, um, where it's somebody else's project, but the library has reached in to embed content. And I think that's um, a very important piece as well. So, I just want to say, you know, that it's all about how you will discover and define your community and know them to advance your work. Um, the community will define the library, and that's really our future, how the community defines us. And it will mean we are in a constant state of change. But without community engagement, the future would be very bleak. And so as we face the future, what could be more energizing than engaging in, and in this case, dancing together? Thank you.